Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship as we begin our study of the Gospel of Mark chapter 2. In this study we will cover verses 1 through 12 and see that Jesus is the forgiver of sins. With each portion of the Gospel of Mark we will see a more intimate portrait of Jesus as he walked among men and few passages show the love of Jesus for sinners as this one. So please follow along in your King James Bible as we begin our study of Mark chapter 2. Uh, Mark chapter 2 verse 1 starts uh, out saying, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, after what we read about in chapter 1. A few days later he enters into Capernaum. And uh, that's important because you have to have some geographical context. I don't know how many of you love history like I do. I hated history in school because it never really gave you any sense of what you're reading and studying. Um, now, I've heard of good, there are good history teachers, but um, um, most kids come out of high school saying they didn't learn much in history, and that's one of the reasons. There was no real life to it. And when you read the Bible, it's the same way. You hear people say, oh, I just get bored with the Bible, or they may not want to admit that, but then they won't read it. And it's because they don't take time to get to know the places, the people, the circumstances, the history. And uh, to try to know Jesus without understanding at least some of Capernaum is like claiming that you know about Moses without knowing anything about Egypt. Uh, how much would you really understand about the story of Moses if you didn't know anything about Egypt? There'd be a lot of blank spaces, a lot of lack of understanding. And uh, just to give you a little background on Capernaum, other than where it's at, is uh, number one, it's not mentioned in the Old Testament. And that's for good reason, because as far as we know, it was founded after the Israelites came back from Babylon. And so if you read what we're studying on Wednesday nights, Daniel. Remember? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they all get taken off to Babylon. Well, they returned, and when they returned, this is a city that was founded um, by those who returned. It is considered the most important city on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, but here's what we want to remember too. It's actually the center of the ministry of Jesus. Bethlehem was where he was born. Nazareth was where he was raised, but Capernaum was where his headquarters was, basically. And uh, so remember Capernaum. And that's why you'll find often where Jesus goes into the synagogue there in Capernaum and teaches. And that reminds us again, this is law. We're still under the law of Moses in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He is reaching out to the Jews. This is an offer to the Jews to receive their Messiah and their kingdom under Messiah. And that helps you ex explain a lot of things you see when you're reading it. Of course, I just want to note these uh, miracles that you'll read about that happened in this place called Capernaum. We uh, have the centurion's paralyzed servant was healed. We see here that uh, we're going to see the paralytic who was carried by friends is healed. Uh, you remember Peter's mother-in-law was healed. And the nobleman's son, uh, the, with faith greater than he'd seen in all of Israel, was healed there in Capernaum. So a lot of events happened there. But also, uh, they, they could have had a uh, Capernaum caucus among the twelve apostles if they wanted. Five out of the twelve came from Capernaum. You have Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew. So that's all interesting stuff, but it doesn't have a happy ending in Capernaum. You remember, Jesus cursed the city. We'll see that when we come to the end of Mark. It's much like America. With Jesus headquartered there. Jesus doing wonderful works there, and yet they would not receive Him. Only a small remnant believed on Him in Capernaum. America has had the greatest gospel witness of any nation on the face of the earth. America has known the hand of God and His blessings. And America is kicking God out. They've expunged Jesus Christ from our school system, the textbooks, and the media only refers to Him in certain contexts, and usually out of context. And on, as we've talked about in sitcoms, movies, and music, He's used more of a cuss word than He is as the Savior of the world. And that's why 
I believe the United States of America is not listed in the text with Bible prophecy. When you study Bible prophecy, you don't find the United States of America, and I believe this is why. The rapture takes place, there's nothing left but the unsaved, payday. We will have turned, if not before then, by then, we will turn against Israel. America will become an enemy of Israel with the rest of the world once the Christians are removed. And it will be time to pay for the babies that have been butchered in the name of abortion. It will be time to pay for the sodomites who have been accommodated and accepted and promoted and even special status in this country where we hold parades spitting in God's face and celebrating something God calls an abomination. Amen. So that's, you see Capernaum, you see America. Here's what Jesus said. He said, And now Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment. So all of that goes into this background of Capernaum. Now when you know all of that and you read, and again he entered into Capernaum, all of a sudden it takes on a little new meaning. A little more depth to our understanding when we read it. And it says, uh, after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. All the charismatic preachers really love that one. I've seen some of them say, and it was noise that he was in the house. You know? <laughs> hey, I got a little charismatic in me. You just have to get used to it. It was noise that Jesus was in the house. What? They, they said that Jesus is in that house. Good question. Do people say about your house? Do they say, I mean, hey, you may think this is bad, but I think it's good when families might take their kids to your house and say, now kids, watch your mouth. We're going to this house and they don't use the language that you, me and your hypocrite dad use in our house. So when you go in this house, I don't want to hear the F word. You understand me there, sissy? Yes. You know, little four-year-old kids using the F word and so and I hope that's what everybody says about your house. And if not, today's the day to go home and clean house. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so what happened? And straightway many were gathered together. Kind of like what we got here. You know, it says, uh, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. That's why we're here. We were in, a, in our house, the, little, the Miller Mansion over there. <laughs> and uh, after... A, Two or three families started coming and got a little crowd, and we thought, you know, let's get in a place where we can be a little more comfortable. And that's what happens. No, not so much as about the door, meaning they were standing out in the yard and couldn't get in the house. It was so crowded. But what did he do? Did he put on a show? Did he, you know, entertain? No, it just says he preached the word unto them. <laughs> Keep it as simple. And that is really the true sign of revival. When people are truly spirit-filled, they will not be kept away from the preaching of the Word because of parking issues, uncomfortable seating, or even the room temperature. <laughs> Amen. 64 degrees, they'll wear gloves before they quit coming. And, or it could be a little warm. I was joking about me and Mike going through menopause. And you know, we're always hot, sweating, hot flashing over here. And Martha's over here going, oh, I'm cold. What do you do? Well, you're never going to suit everybody's temperature needs. Parking. We got a pretty good deal here. But, you know, there's that one Saturday or Sunday of the month where they have the breakfast and it's kind of hard to find a spot or there's only a handful left. What if you did have to park down the street and walk two blocks? Would you do that? When people really are spirit-filled, they want to be under the preaching of the Word. They'll put up with some of that stuff. It says, And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Now, palsy. Paralysis. Okay, it, it, palsy is a form of paralysis. It, notice it says, But which was born of four. That means it was carried by four people. And so... That's a serious case of palsy. He couldn't even limp with part of his body. He had to be, you, you, it's called dead weight. You ever had to lift a body? Whether, I'm not saying dead or alive, but if they are unconscious, 
that so-called dead weight. And so you got this guy, he's dead weight. He's conscious, evidently, but he can't move. And so that's a severe form of paralysis. Um, and again, this is what I always say. We talk about uh, the issue of healing and the charismatic thing, you know, and, and the doctrine. That it really just a lot of it's just common sense. You never see someone carried in, totally unable to move, with one of these faith healers laying hands on them, healing. And when anybody follows them around with a camera, what you find is they'll come in and say they have a, a you know bad ear or or you know some other cancer or something like that. And they'll put them in a wheelchair and then wheel them on stage and lift them out of the wheelchair and act like it's a healing. Mm -hmm. And then the people, they're kind of caught up in the euphoria of the moment and they just kind of go along with it. And then he hits them, they knock down, and like, you know. And then when it's all said and done, they're like, wait a minute, I still got this problem. <laughs> yeah. But the cameras are turned off by then. You don't see that kind of thing with Jesus. What you see is this guy who's totally unable to move carried in by four people, and it says, and when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, that's not the media, the news that's media, that's, <laughs> that's the press of people, they're all packed in like sardines, and they uncovered the roof where he was. Now there it goes, it helps to know a little bit about the construction in that day. They didn't have a solid uh, roof with sheetrock and nails and everything like we've got. They, had to, they just peeled away what was thrown on top as a roof. And they were able to then lower this man. It says, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And so, and again, what we're doing now is how you're cured of all the uh, false teaching and, and the false movements as you just look at it. And he, they, they lay down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Uh, and Jesus didn't look and say, did God tell you to come here to be... <laughs> Did you give your seed faith offering to the usher at the door? <laughs> yeah, that's what the kind of questions that these guys ask. And look what the response is. And again, this is twisted by people. But it says in verse 5, I want you to read that with me. When Jesus saw their faith, He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Why do you call Him Son? Because He's a Jew. Jesus saw their faith. He didn't see their faith in their faith. He saw their faith in Him. You see, the charismatic word faith is a more proper term. The word faith teaching is that God honors your faith, but it's in the sense of you having enough faith to be healed. In the Bible, God honors your faith in Jesus as your Messiah, as the Son of God. You see, there's a difference. And that difference is all the difference in the world. It's an occult perversion to say that you should have enough faith to be healed. That's putting the onus on you and your ability to conjure up faith. The Bible says that you are a child of God and you receive the blessings of God because of your faith in God who came in the person of Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. You don't have faith in your faith. You have faith in God. And then you submit to Him and whatever His will is. And that's as simple as it is. It's a, and that's another thing. God makes it simple. Man and religion makes it complicated. When it becomes so complicated, you've got to keep buying tapes and DVDs and buying this series and that series. And it's all teaching the same thing. But it's just regurgitating it in different ways and forms to keep you thinking that what you're learning is true. It's, that takes effort because it's so simple that if you get your eyes off that garbage and just on the Word, you're set free. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing all the cults do. They'll tell you, don't just read the Bible. They'll say read the Bible, but don't just read the Bible. You also need your watchtower. <laughs> don't just read your Bible. You also need the infallible pronouncements of the Pope. Don't just read your Bible, but read the church fathers also. So, back to the text though, let's emphasize what happened here. That Jesus saw their faith, and He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Notice that. 
There's a lot there to notice. Uh, first of all, we already mentioned this, that they saw their faith in Him as Messiah, which immediately resulted in forgiveness, not healing. So does that suggest that if you're sick, it's because of your sin? No, or it's suggesting that before you worry about being physically ill, you better worry about the fact you're going to hell. Right. That's what he's saying is priorities. There, how many people you know that don't, you don't even know if they're even saved, but all of a sudden they get sick and they go off to the faith healer? Well, the first thing to take care of is your soul. And so Jesus is saying, you've got faith, your sins are forgiven. So he's making, first of all, a priority there of forgiveness and not healing. So again, you look, he says, son, thy sins be forgiven. That should stand out. He didn't even, didn't even look or acknowledge the issue of palsy. He acknowledged, first of all, the issue that this is a sinner who has come to me in faith, therefore he's saved, his sins are forgiven. And if Jesus were God, that would make him a blasphemer. And that's lost, hold on just a second, Martha. That's lost on people today. That when Jesus said thy sins, they're called to, well, to teach, yeah, Jesus forgave sins, but they'll deny he's God. They'll deny his deity. If Jesus is not God in human form, then forgiving sins would be blasphemy. And that explains then the response of the people. It says in verse 6 and 7, But there were certain of the scribes sitting there. They were there for the wrong reasons. And reasoning in their hearts. Now I'll just say this. A lot of people wonder why I teach the way I do and preach the way I do. Because I just, I don't, I don't, believe, I don't ever let up. I don't ever compromise on something that's in that text. Why? Because once you do that, that makes the scribes feel comfortable mm -hmm. and they'll keep coming. But if you just preach it hard the way it's written, the scribes will not stick around. And the scribes are sitting here just looking for something to make trouble over. And churches are filled with scribes because the preacher compromises. And if you just keep preaching it hard, because you'll notice... They're here now, but they can't stand it. Eventually, they stop coming around Jesus. Because yeah. He keeps preaching it hard. But the scribes are sitting there, and they're reasoning in their hearts. Now, I'm not going to try to guess who might be doing that, but you ever, anybody in here ever sitting there thinking, oh, I wish this was over. Oh, I wish this would... Oh, I'm hungry. <laughs> I see people looking at their yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't bring mine. Do you realize Pittsburgh plays Cincinnati and it comes on at one? <laughs> I admit there's been times I've done that. And at that moment, I was no better than these wicked scribes. Mm -hmm. I was just sitting there because once you start that, you go down the road. You'll find other things to get. And then eventually you start making trouble. Yep. So a lot of that comes down to the attitude of the person sitting there. Are you here for the right reason? Did you come because you really want to learn the Word of God? And if so, football can wait. And I know, Mike, this is going to be hard to believe, but so can the food. Oh, come on. <laughs> 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 so anyway, there's these uh, men, and it, look at what they're reasoning in their hearts. I'm going to defend them for a second. These scribes aren't too off base here. Look what they say. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? You see, if Jesus was just a man, he's a blasphemer. And they were right. If at that moment they didn't believe he was God manifest in the flesh, they were right in questioning him. Where they were wrong is in their refusal for three and a half years, and even after he rose from the dead, their refusal to accept him as God manifest in the flesh, who can forgive sins. That's where they were wrong. Yes, who can forgive sins but God only? That's an absolute statement of fact. Only God can. Well, this is why we consider the Roman Catholic practice of the confessional and priestly absolution to be nothing short of blasphemous. A man with a collar on doth not have power to forgive sins. 
And you don't confess your sins to another man unless he's the one you offended with your sin. You go to God and to the offended parties. That's all. And if I didn't do it, or I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't offended by you doing it, we don't need to talk about it. That's between you and God and the person or people that you offended by doing it. And uh, immediately it says, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? Of course, Jesus would ask questions. He knew the answers. But just like a good parent, there's times where I'm looking at Kayla and I'm saying, were you in the chocolate? What's that on Little six-year-old girl shaking her head no, and then you, she's got a mustache. Mm -hmm. <laughs> six-year-old girls don't have mustaches. That's chocolate. I'll never forget the look on her face. She was just as serious as could be. No, Daddy, I wasn't in the chocolate. <laughs> well, then here's a razor. Go shave. <laughs> well, I knew the answer, but as a good parent, you've got to bring it out. And that's what Jesus is trying to do with these guys. Bring them out. Get them to, get them to talk. And to, to con you, you, you can't hide your sin. Sin has got to be dealt with. And that's what he's doing. He says, he, he asks them a question. He says, whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk? Obviously, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. So in order to demonstrate that he has the power to forgive sins, he's going to show his divinity. He's going to show something none of these faith healers can show, is the power to heal at will. It doesn't matter whether you have faith or not. It doesn't matter whether you gave a seed faith offering or not. It doesn't matter anything except the will of the healer and that's what Jesus is going to show here as in verses 10 11 he says but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins he saith to the sick of the palsy I say unto thee arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house and immediately he arose took up the bed and went forth before them all in so much that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. And folks, we ain't seen it since. And anybody claiming, this is where I came to a conclusion in my years among these word faith type churches and everything, anybody claiming this was a blasphemer. Because they are elevating themselves up to the place of Jesus Christ who could do these things they claim to be able to do. And that's why you find so many of these blasphemers, you find them like on that movie that we have, that DVD, where Benny Hinn is handing his music minister a crack pipe. Or heroin pipe. And his head of his ministry died of an overdose of heroin. And you see... Uh, him carting off with other women in, in Rome and caught on camera. You see, the reason why we haven't s seen that since Jesus, and they hadn't seen it before, is because He is unique. That's why you hear people refer to Jesus as the unique Son of God. It's in the true sense before. He was God manifest in the flesh. See, you and I are sons of God, but it's by faith we are adopted as sons of God. Jesus is unique. He's the eternal Son of God. And that's why we refer to Jesus as the judge. Only Jesus can forgive sins. And when you pass this life into the next, you will stand before a judge. If you're a Christian, you will not be judged whether or not you're saved but you still will face the judge. Romans 4.10 14.10 why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? And the context again is important. It's talking about not being a hypocrite 
and judging your brother when you yourself are guilty. But look what it says. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He's talking to Christians. And he says we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Again, we read in 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear. He's only talking to Christians there. 2 Corinthians 5.10 is talking to Christians. And he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that, to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. There's going to be rewards. There's going to be loss. I know that's hard to put your hands around because we always talk about we die and go to heaven and everything's honky-dory. Well, in a sense, yes, I mean, you're saved, you're eternally going to be in heaven. But there still is going to be judgment. There still is going to be reward and loss. And if you look it up, you will not see, I remind everybody this constantly, when all tears shall be wiped away, that's after... The next judgment we're going to talk about, we're going to look at real quick, that's after this great white throne. If you're not saved, you stand at a different judgment. And it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. All the unsaved are going to stand there and also be judged according to their works. Now, not everybody agrees with this, but I believe that there is going to be a different degree of punishment in hell. Oh, yeah. I think that the, the guy next door who was a nice neighbor but just wouldn't believe the gospel, but he you know, was a decent guy and all that, his eternal punishment will not be the exact same as Adolf Hitler's. Just as an example. Now, we don't, we're not given real deep information about that. But it does say that there is going to be a judgment based on your works. All are cast in the lake of fire. But what's that mean? Well, they evidently appears that there is a difference in punishment. We don't understand it all. It's one of those things we'll understand better by and by. But it does appear that way. But the point is, Jesus is the judge at both the judgment seat of Christ, and the great white throne judgment. And that's why Philippians 2, 9-11 says, Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He can forgive sins. He's the only one who can forgive sins. You have to turn to Jesus. No one else can forgive sins. Not Muhammad, not Buddha, not some priest, not Confucius, not some New Age guru. No one can forgive sins but Jesus Christ. And we must turn to Him, believing like the man with palsy, Believing in Jesus as the unique Son of God, who then we now know was crucified, buried, but rose again. And He conquered sin and conquered death. And by trusting in Him, we have eternal life. Be sure to visit our website at kjvbiblebelievers.com where you can find a wealth of mp3 audio message downloads along with additional videos, articles, and links. This message is brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. I am Greg Miller. Thank you for listening.